Welcome to New Mexico Entertainment, the podcast. Yes, yes, yes. We are back with a brand new episode of New Mexico Entertainment, the podcast. This is Teresa Robinson, publisher and editor-in-chief of New Mexico Entertainment Magazine. And I'm sure you have already heard our first episode, which was uploaded to our brand new podcast channel. William Zapka from The Karate Kid. So we thought it'd be fitting to continue with the Karate Kid himself, Ralph Macchio. We had the opportunity to interview him back in early January of 2018, our first interview of that year. And we talked about his rise to fame through that movie as we prepared for him to attend an event here in Albuquerque. So enjoy. Yeah, hey, it's Ralph Macchio calling in. Hey, how you doing? Good, good. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you, too, and thank you for taking the time out to talk to me today. Yeah, no, he squeezed it in. I'm, uh, I, I gave him a hard out time, and I said, okay, let's let's do it now. Catch it when you can. So uh, so I'm, I'm happy to. I'm looking forward to uh, to getting down there in the next couple weeks. Yes, um, I'm excited to have you come out. That, that they are very excited to see you. Uh, that's great. Well, hopefully all the folks come on out. It's a, it's a good, it's a good, insane time. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, so just a few questions, um, and we'll start with one I'm always interested in when it comes to actors. Where did your love of acting come from? Well, I think, um, uh, you know, I grew up at a time where my mom was home and she would watch uh, what in New York it was called the Channel 11 430. It was called the Million Dollar Movie, um, which in, in 2017, a million dollar movie is, you know, like a commercial. <laughs> but uh, from a budget standpoint, but it was a Channel 11 would have these old like the MGM musicals and the classics like Casablanca and all that. And that she would have that on all the time. And I'd watch these movies. Uh, with her. I mean, I did my share of, of watching cartoons and other stuff like any other kid, but I sort of, you know, got a little taste of, of, of cinema and storytelling, and I, I, uh, I, I fell in love with Gene Kelly at a young age. I wanted to be Gene Kelly because I found him su- such a, you know, masculine kind of uh, actor, dancer, handsome, good, you know, good looking, and, and, uh, and uh, so I, that was sort of like a early stage of like, you know, getting on stage. And I took a few like theater dance classes when I was a kid. I'm talking like, you know, uh, anywhere from like 10, 11, 12. And I enjoyed it and I didn't stink at it. So um, so that's what that's what that's my earliest memory of it. And then um, of, of sort of uh, wanting to delve into it. Uh, as far as working and everything else that happened, that's that's a you know it's a bazillion to one whether you ever get in and ever get uh, fortunate enough to play any roles that people remember. Well, you landing the Outsiders landed you with a slew of actors that it seems like that particular film was a start for everyone in it. Did you yeah. did you have any idea how successful the film would become? Uh, not, not totally. What's, what's interesting is the outsiders. I read that book when I was 12 and I, it was the first book I ever read cover to cover. And I think, you know, the S.C. E. Hinton, uh, you know, launched in that, in my generation launched a lot of readers like uh, J.K. Rowling, you could argue launched so many with Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, that, that young adult l- literature was, I mean, the outsiders was the choice of it was required reading in school and still is in many schools. So it was a dream come true to, to be in that film, get that role. Um, and then, uh, you know, so we all, as young actors, and it, it is quite an impressive cast, we all felt like we were in the coolest movie ever. And that Francis Ford Coppola, one of the greatest filmmakers in our of our time, was directing it. You know, we had a feeling that it would have been the, the greatest thing ever. But uh, you know, the film itself, it was it was well received, but it wasn't. Um, you know, it did not open like Rogue One, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, but but it but it over time because of the book, the book feeds the movie, the movie feeds the book, and as 
if you witness these, uh, you know, segueing into what I'm going to be doing in Albuquerque and, and meeting fans, I get these young, I call them the out, my outsiders kids. They're like anywhere from 12 to maybe 11 to 16 uh, as the core. And then they go, uh, you know, and they go up until, you know, into my age and older. But these kids are just uh, falling in love with that book and that movie for the first time. It's nice when you're involved with something that, reinvents itself with each generation and has Absolutely. that kind of lasting power. And I, I, I do not take that for granted. And I really, uh, really enjoy that. And that was, you know, that role for me, that was, that was like your first, your first love, your first girlfriend, your first kiss, you never forget it, you know, and the, and Johnny Cade and the Outsiders was, was that for me. So what lessons would you say you walked away with being that that was one of your first major roles? What lessons did you walk away with from that movie? Um, well, from that movie, it was, I mean, a lot of it had to do with Francis Coppola and what he instilled in us, all young actors, you know, everyone thinking they're the next, you know, at that age, you think you're invincible, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, rehearsal and preparation was a big part of what uh, what Francis brought to the table. He really wanted to create a, a sort of um, theater atmosphere. Uh, for about two weeks before we uh, before we shot the movie, we re he really wanted the guys to spend a lot of uh, uh, a lot of time together. The greasers were separated from the socias. Uh, the the socias had better rooms. They had they had better transportation. Wow. They had better better script binders. We were given like you know a composition notebook and a you know, a, a, a lower room at the a hotel, and we were driven around in a van where the where the socias were driven around in like nice town cars and stuff. And and he sort of set that up, so it he created that environment. It was kind of fun. And then and then within 48 hours, everyone called their agents and said, "Yo, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of funny story Francis laughs about today, you know, because." Uh, but that's that's just a little anecdotal piece that kind of might be fun for for what you're writing. Well, it, it definitely it sounds like something that definitely works for those roles. That is really interesting. Yeah, yeah, it was very. He was, you know, he was very. Um, he was it, it's a, it's a fun. He not, not he wasn't necessarily the Godfather, but he was the one we all looked up to, you know, <laughs> and uh, he was definitely leading the band. So when it comes to the Karate Kid. Which honestly, the movie made you an icon. Do you remember right. the moment you were given the role of Daniel? Uh, I do remember the moment. I mean, there were two. There were two moments. I mean, there, there were two moments. Uh, the biggest, the biggest ones I remember. One was uh, when I I uh, met with John Avildsen, who was the director. Mm -hmm. And that video footage is on YouTube. You could find it. Um, and it's my actual first reading. He actually intercut my first audition reading with Pat Morita's first audition reading. He intercut that, and you can find that on on YouTube. Um, um, and it's really amazing. I look at it sometimes, and it, it just it blows me away because you don't know when you're doing it what, what uh, you know how it's coming out. But that clearly, when I look back at my first reading, cold, you know, just holding the script for the first time. When, it, when you see that reading, you could see Daniel LaRusso from, you know, from from uh, from square one. Yeah. And I remember Avelston right after that reading said to me, he goes, uh, I can't guarantee anything at this point, but because um, obviously I have to talk to Los Angeles and Columbia Pictures and he said, but if I were you, I'd start taking some karate lessons. Wow. And that was that was like the most. And, for, and then as I walked out of his apartment, there was the Oscar for Rocky and the poster for Rocky, which are, that he won and, and directed and and save the tiger with Jack Lemon, and I was just, it was like, uh, I'm not in Kansas anymore. Uh, this was, but I didn't have the part yet, but that was the the thrill moment, like, holy, you know, holy <laughs> crap, this might happen. And then I had to go out to Los Angeles, they flew me out, and we, I met with uh, Pat Morita, and we, um, we tested together. Um, but I was always in first position. It was finding who Miyagi would be. That was the bigger challenge. And, you know, because nobody wanted Pat Morita besides the director. Everyone thought, you know, ah, this is Arnold from Happy Days. It's not the way the role was written. So it goes to show you um, how wrong everybody was as he, he created one of the most, you know, just a beautiful performance. Absolutely. Oscar nominated performance. So that's that's my uh, – that's and then, so then I did get the call that I had the uh, – 
um, the part. And then, but it, by then, I had done so much work, even though I wasn't given the role. They were putting me so many through so many hoops, and I was the only one around. It wasn't like I was. I mean, I knew uh, the Charlie Sheen because I knew Charlie through Emilio Estevez and The Outsiders, uh, his brother. Uh, I knew Charlie Sheen was a, 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 was a, a backup candidate. I knew Robert Downey Jr. at the time was someone who I knew from the first movie I ever did called Up the Academy. His dad directed. Mm -hmm. So I knew that, but I was always it was always me and whoever else they were looking for for the other roles. So I I felt pretty good. So when I got the call, I was a little maybe I was a little cocky, like yeah, of course. Um, but. Uh, but those are my that's my long winded answer to a very simple question. <laughs> well, when was the moment that you realized because it became a hit? What was the moment that you realized that that movie had changed your career? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I mean, I get asked that all the time. It never gets old because it's. Um, I mean, to the best of my memory, I always have to say that now that it's been thirty something years because you know as it goes on you you sort of fantasize about what the the truth is yeah. but i re I distinctively remember um seeing the film for the first time in its entirety in New York at the coronet the baronet coronet theaters on second a third avenue um on the upper east side. It was a sneak preview end of May, probably about four weeks before the film was to come out on June 22nd. And, uh, and the director was there and the, and the producer and writer, and it was a packed house of just, you know, just a sneak preview, sneak preview of the Karate Kid. I don't know how they filled the house and what the word was, but I had heard that the movie was good from the studio and, and they were talking about, uh, you know, Pat Morita's chemistry and mine together. And I felt that when we were shooting as mm -hmm. well, but, uh, I saw it by seeing the movie and every and and seeing the audience respond to this guy who was just essentially me who showed up to read the lines. You know, it was so out of body experience for me to to sort of be caught up in the the uh, the audience being with this story every step, and then and then certainly with the climax of the movie and everyone jumping up and hugging each other and cheering. Um, it, that, that I, I, I could never, I, I can't say there's ever been a moment like that in my lifetime where I had no idea going in and then it just felt like everything was different when I walked out. And then every, um, everyone on the street on third Avenue was doing the crane kick, whether they're six years old or 60 years old. And that's when the producer leaned over and says, we're going to be making a couple of these. <laughs> Unbelievable. Isn't that a great story? I love that story. It's a great, it's a true story. I mean, and, and I still didn't know because I was kind of green and young, just, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, I still didn't know the enormity of it. And, you know, great films are only defined over time. Half the people you talk to, if you ask them what won the Oscar last year for Best Picture, who won Best Actor, Best Actor, you know, I would say more than 70% of the people would have no clue. But if you mention The Godfather or, 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 or Pulp Fiction, or the Karate Kid, for that matter. You mentioned there time defines the the worth and staying power of a movie. Yeah. So I have to ask, me that you you've been in the business for so long, and you've done so many films and so many projects. Have you ever had a moment? I I know some folks that um have done film and they dread seeing themselves on screen. Did you ever have that problem? Well, it's happening more now. It never happened when I was a kid because, I mean, you look good from every side, you know. You got yeah. full thick hair, you're young, there's never a bad angle. Now it's like, oh, you got to watch that. <laughs> oh, boy, gotta, maybe I should get some hair filler over there. You're looking a little thin on that side. Or, wow, those dark circles under my eyes are really starting to sink in. You know, you start... And with HD, there's no, for, I mean, the actresses, my God, the, the women, because there's so much of the stigmas about mm -hmm. how you look as you age. It's, you know, the technology of, uh, of you know, HD, there's not, there's not, there's nobody's friend. Um, so, yes, now, now I'm a little bit more uh, of just like the, the aesthetic part of it, uh -huh. even though I'm, you know, I'm doing preserving pretty good for my, for my age. But I will say, and from a performance uh standpoint I've, it has always been an uncomfortableness with ah, I thought I thought there was a better take on that and 
Oh, that's the one he used. He stayed in the white shot. Darn, the, the medium shot is a great one. You know, and you start editing in your head and you want to micromanage. But that's why when I explain that scenario of watching the Karate Kid, the whole movie for the first time, at that point, I wasn't looking at that because I saw the 500 people that were in the theater yeah. were just engrossed in the story. But when you watch it by yourself, you could start uh, nitpicking, you know. And then it's uh, as you get older, it, it becomes a little tougher to to uh, to, to watch yourself because you can't uh, always, you know, you, you can't you don't get you don't you don't have the option of telling them what shot to go with. Oh, so you have to trust. <laughs> so. Um... I I know you've performed in um uh, with many actors um two of them being Joe Pesci and Marissa Tomei and my cousin Vinny. What was right. the experience like? It was great. My cousin Vinny was um I mean it was it was odd for me with Joe cuz I knew Joe uh, Marissa was obviously fresh and new on the scene and obviously what a turn that was for her. She's just wonderful and, and so much stuff. But Joe I knew because I was on Broadway in a in a play called Cuban is Teddy Bear at Robert De Niro and he, we, we played father and son and Joe would come uh, by the theater occasionally and that was not long, be a couple of years before my cousin Vinny. So uh, the the tough thing for the toughest part of my cousin Vinny is I was kind of isolated from because I most of my scenes were in the fr first act, and then the, and then it was all the courtroom stuff. Yeah. Um. I had a I had a great time making the film. I didn't know. I mean, we all knew Marissa, and you could tell she was just anything she did was she was just, you know, such a star in the making. And Joe, obviously, he won the uh, Academy Award for Goodfellas when we were shooting that. So uh, when we were shooting my cousin Vinny, matter of fact, he brought the Oscar to the set and like just kept placing it <laughs> in every scene. <laughs> Um, uh, My Cousin Vinny is one of the funniest American comedies ever. I mean, it really is a movie that if you, if it's on and you have dinner at seven and it's 6.30 and you're in your house, you might as well just tell the restaurant you're going to be late because you just can't stop watching those those scenes. They're very, very funny. Every setup pays off beautifully. Uh, great script by Dale Lawner and, uh, and um, you know, people, it's interesting. You mentioned these these couple of films. You know, Vinny, the Outsiders, the Karate Kid. I mean, people. There aren't many films people reference lines from as much mm -hmm. um, as those, and it's kind of interesting that I, in a short period of time, it's not like I've done a gazillion movies, but in that short window of time from say eighty, eighty three, eighty three to ninety three, so those ten years, I got those three movies that uh, still kind of have a staying power, and people could reference. And it's wonderful to have that under your belt. There's not a lot of people that can say that that have been acting for this many years. Yeah, and listen, it's a, you know I I'd love to take credit for it. Um, I was just you know lucky enough to be the right guy at the right time, and a couple of them that that had that kind of uh, iconic is always overused. But I mean, you could say about, you know that it has some of them have that element to it, and they define. A certain time, and uh, and but my cousin Vinny, a lot of people say that that is just their favorite, and uh, it's kind of fun. It's kind of, and that that's what happens when I do, do these fan experiences, which is what I call these Comic Cons. Started as one thing, and now they become sort of pop culture events where it gives Absolutely. you know anyone a chance uh, to uh, to uh, to meet someone that they either grew up with or they want to or they're a fan of, and then and then it's fun to do the panels and give back. A little bit of uh, like I'm giving to you some behind the scenes stuff. That that uh, that's a lot of fun. Well, when it comes to looking back at your career and what you have done, would you do you have a particular role that you found the most challenging to play? Um, that's a good question. I I mean a couple of them, you know, may not have been uh, certainly not as uh, you know as. Uh, uh, known as famously for as the ones we've been discussing and the outsiders was not difficult to play but i put a lot into it because i really wanted to you know find that whole tulsa language cadence and and this character so i i enjoyed it but it was it was work larusso and the and the and the karate kid it was work because i was in so much um but it was in essence i was just trying to be as natural piece of me as uh, as possible in that character. Um, uh, there was a, a role I played in a film for television called The Bobby Garwood Story, 
the last POW I did with Martin Sheen, okay. and uh, and that was a real challenging uh, challenging role, and also the shooting schedule made it challenging. Um, they all come with their, you know, they all come with those moments of ease and those and their and the the moments of of uh, daunting uh, <laughs> difficulty. I mean. Uh, you have to just trust it. And there's some days you go home smiling and other days you go home like, oh, I just blew it. And you just have to move past it. It's very difficult to do even to this day. I'm working. I just finished a show called The Deuce uh, for HBO with uh, James Franco, Maggie Gyllenhaal. It's going to be on HBO this year. Um, I don't have a big part in it. But I'm in five of the eight episodes. And there were, you know, some stuff felt just great and other stuff I was in and out of there so quick. I was, ah, I didn't nail it the way I wanted to and you just can't get caught up in that you have to trust the the collaborative effort and and trust your your people you're working with and trust yourself as well and you know I've done some direct I've done some directing and in, in, uh, myself and so I understand a little bit more from that side of it um, and that helps well you've now been on screen um, both film small screen and in theater uh, which would you find is more challenging, but also mm. more rewarding? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's nothing. Listen, theater, there's a beauty to theater because you're presenting the entire piece and you're communally experiencing it together. Um, um, so I do enjoy, you know, when the train leaves the station, you, you, you know, for that 90 minutes or two hours or whatever, the piece is that that you're going to experience it with uh, the people in the room, and there's just something. Uh, it's some. It's a very gift giving from both sides. It's like you give this gift this pre- of this of this story that you're telling, this character you're portraying, and you receive this gift of acceptance from the audience. Mm-hmm. There's something that that's irreplaceable about that. But I do also enjoy the exacting of film and fil- and film for television, finding those pieces that connect the fabric of a full performance for a for for film and and television and then and then it being preserved there's something nice about when you do get it right and you nail it or there's something wonderful and you have it forever where theater it's you know it's it might be there tuesday and somewhere wednesday it's just not the same and then thursday and thursday might be better than tuesday but you don't know that on wednesday (laughs) so being that you brought up uh Grace Kelly, in the beginning of the interview, I guess it's no surprise to me then that Dancing with the Stars was such an exciting thing to take part of. Yeah, I mean, listen, I had no, at first I was like, I'm not, I felt like Gilligan in Gilligan's Island saying, I'm not going to wear a dress, I'm not going to wear a dress, and then you cut and there's Gilligan in a dress. Uh, not that I ever wore a dress, but, uh, you know, I said I would never do that show, not never do it, I was not. It was not my cup of tea at first, just the whole produced, uh, you know, uh, the produced element of the machine of what the show is, but it was just the right time. It was just the right time. And I, you know, I did, I did well, I did well enough. I mean, I, I, uh, for the most part, anyone who sees me says great things about it. So I think how you represent yourself is a big part of the experience of that show and then you have to know and it's difficult especially when you go deep into it as I did that it is a produced entity and you are you know one of the players on this day you you know I'm not going to say you're the pawn uh or the or the marionette puppet but you are you know you're at the mercy of where uh, how they want the end results now I'm not saying it's not not in a way of it being fixed as much as manipulated by um how it uh you know how it turns out but i will say this much if you put if you represent yourself well you'll come out well i'm i'm proof of that i tried to put positive forward even when i got frustrated with the machine of the show i will say this much there's no there's nothing on television like it that it gives you the kind of platform and wants everyone to succeed it's not train wreck tv it really wants the nostalgic uh you know uh element to prevail and 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 uh, redemption and good over evil it's all the it's all the good things and i i have a lot of respect for what they do week in and week out on dancing with the stars and i'm an alumni and i'm proud of it (laughs) well when it comes to seeing your work you definitely embrace everything you do you want to give 110 percent 
So when it comes to the roles that you've done, what has each role meant to you? Well, they're, they're different. I mean, there's, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to wrap my head around the best way to answer that. Um, you learn from each. I think that's probably the first thing that comes to mind is to try to learn from each to feel, you know, anytime you're doing, making a film or, or an original play or, or a television series, if you feel that you've have it figured out, then I think you're fooling yourself because it, truthfully, no one is making, everyone is making the movie for the first time. Mm -hmm. Everyone is making that show for the first time. Every, everyone in that cast and, and, and is, uh, is creating this world for the first time. So really try to learn from it and try to, uh, you know, and embrace all the curveballs because if you don't, you're going to be striking out a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because it's it's they're not all fastballs down the middle. So, but that takes years to figure out, and even when you figure it out, you still don't have it all figured out. So, I think educating myself each time, using what I've learned to better myself each time. Um, I think I'm not necessarily exactly answering your question, but it is it is something poignant, I think, in in that answer. Oh. I think if you learn a lesson from each role that you've done, that is a pretty well uh, said answer to me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Great. <laughs> so, so are you coming out to uh, where? I don't even know where this. Uh, where, I'm going to be in Albuquerque, right? Yep. I just don't know where the uh, where okay. the event. Is. Yep. I I go every year. It's it's exciting to to come out and just see everyone who participates. And I mean, it obviously. It's exciting for me just to, I'm a people watcher, so it is also fun. Oh, well, then you're, then you're in heaven. <laughs> yeah. So it's always to see those who come out to see the fans so excited about um, who's there. And just even talking to friends of mine and people that I've talked to, they're just excited to hear that you're coming. How, how do you feel about, you know, the fans that have been, cre um, that you've, you know, created in a sense, having your career, what do your fans mean to you? Well, they're, you know, they are um, so embracing. Um, and so, you know, I'm the one thing about doing these types of things, and I've been for the last, you know, few years, been dipping my toe into it. And then I, I, I enjoy it um, because there's, you wind up making people happy. Um, and that's in a, in a world that is not always such a happy place. Um, it's sort of nice to be able to do that and not have to do anything, but just be nice to people. Um, and, and, uh, and take a moment and especially when people bring their kids and it's, it's a way to carry on the legacy of some of those earlier films and then talk a little bit about what's up and coming. Um, it's, 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 it's fun to do that and to share and, and to hear the stories the people have I I was at you know I I met my husband that when we went to see this movie at this theater or or um, you know I named my kids so and so after this character and this and you know you touch people's lives and it's a way to connect and hear these these stories and then to give back uh, from so I get as much out of it as the fans do in a different way and uh, it's a it's a it's a nice love affair we have going and I try to. Um, you know, hopefully they, they, they look to the new stuff I'm doing as well as uh, keep uh, some of the classics up there uh, over time. Well, you are now close to three decades of working in the industry. What would you like your legacy to be? Uh, that's a, that's always that. That's the end of the inside the actor studio, like the, the yes. big, the big, the big. But this is a, it's a good question. The legacy, I mean, that I, that I am, honestly, that I, that I embraced it wholeheartedly. I was genuine and and tried to be as true as I can to to the work and understanding and never take for granted what I what I gained from it. Thank you, Ralph, again for taking time out to talk to me in this new year, and we look forward to seeing you when you get here. You got a first interview of the year. It's yours. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll, see you I'll see you. I'll see you down where it's warm. All right. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye.